Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Ricardo Heisman. <laughs> For English people, it's very different uh, sound. It's a real, real, uh, it's a real Dutch sound. Okay. Uh, I'd like to present you uh, my latest artistic research project. Project. It's called the Bone Conductor, as it develops at this moment. Uh, the goal of the project is to gain more inclusive knowledge of the sound habitat by sharing multisensory hearing experiences of sight and hearing disabled people. Uh, yes, uh, I like to um, let you hear some uh, sound examples also. Therefore, I, um, I, uh, I have to skip some information, but you can find it later in the, in the paper. My uh, artistic uh, statement is we can be more aware of our being sound performers and conductors of our own sound habitat. So that's performers and conductors. You can see it as uh, creative, a, a creative act, but also as, yeah, as, as we are in the sound habitat, performing and conducting. Uh, my ongoing artistic research is what I call uh, the multisensorial hearing perspective. Uh, it's about how the hearing is influenced by the information of the other senses, how we, how we develop our personal hearing perspective depending our sense abilities or disabilities, attentions, talents, taste, how we are moving our body, trying to stay in balance with while negotiating through and being part of the local sound habitat where we live and work with the rules and customs of our society, the culture in which we grew up, the intimacy of the parental home, where we did our first steps towards the other, while starting with babble and touch, learning the way to commu communicate, hearing and listening. Our multisensorial hearing perspective as part of our personal story and cultural identity. As a sound image artist and soundscape composer, I am creating interactive tactile sonic sculpture installations. The sound sculptures are covered with woolen blanket material and producing tangible and audible touch sound. Composed soundscapes or sandscapes, as you wish, causing an intensified multi-sensorial hear hearing experience. I invite the public to become responsible and responsible performers themselves when experiencing the sound sculpture installation and becoming conductors of their own multi-sensorial hearing perspective. I'm also working as a, sense, a DJ Sensecape. Then I'm uh, also combining uh, a sculpture with direct uh, mixing DJ, it's something uh, that, that's very uh, direct live uh, improvisation. So. And as a community sound artist, I'm working with yeah, several groups from all ages, from zero to, uh, to 100. <laughs> I, I work with the, uh, yeah, vulnerable uh, elder people in uh, care centers and um, but also with uh, yeah with little children and with their parents so and everybody between and because my um, installations are triggering mul uh, multimodal senses i also yeah present them for people with hearing disabilities or uh, blind people etc also uh, introducing the bound collector project now it's a interactive tactile sonic uh, sculpture installation and it consists of a, a woolen sound bone I made, you will see it directly, with, uh, in the combination with bone conducting headphones. So it's uh, really it's, uh, a combination of uh, multiple sensory hearing perspectives because uh, the bone conducting headphone you place it uh, before, uh, before, the, before the ears so, and the, the information the soundscape information that I composed for it is going directly to the inner ear. 
So it, it's really also it's also used for people with they call it uh, conductive uh, hearing loss, and uh, that's uh, when they have problems with with ears and eardrums. Then um, they, they, then they are they, they can hear better because they, the the sound information is directly going to the inner ear. So, but I'm combining this with uh, a wooden sound bone. And I invite the public to become conductors, and it's a playful introduction. In the start, it, it's also a playful introduction in, to the principles of bone conduction. Uh, I don't hear this. Ah. the sounds that you heard is just uh, an impression because uh, but there was also the the, the element uh, I put in the element of yeah of getting closer to the to the sound bone so but in in real you also can touch and it's really complementary the the two uh, hearing perspectives are mixing together so uh, I first presented uh, this bone conduction installation in a factory hall near my atelier. Uh, for this presentation, I compose soundscapes like the orchestrated scene, with orchestrated scene sounds you heard. Uh, the thing is that you can uh, yeah, feel them very, very uh, well and, and intense. Uh, you heard a piece of uh, the Love Conductor uh, composition, and it's a forgoted voice, and you get literally touched by it. Uh, other uh, composition where the bone orchestra and also uh, a sandscape. As you can see, the uh, now there's there's the uh, the bone conducting headphones. And that's you place it before the ears on the cheekbone, <coughs> so uh, it's going the sounds going directly to the inner ear, and you are also can hear the surroundings. Also the the the, the reflected the, the first the, the reflected sounds and the vibration of the whole uh, place and so you still uh, you you still stay connected with uh, with, the, with the surroundings and yes people were um, uh, the, it is also an interesting element of that the, the the headphone information is fixed so when you are changing or uh, your position or moving it always stays fixed, and it's it basically it's a stereo. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, I made it with binaural, uh, also with binaural uh, recordings. But yeah, this 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 a nice twist to have a binaural um, uh, source directly to your to your inner ears also, and that's also interesting for blind people and for people with hearing disabilities, and. Of course, when you're entering uh, uh, the room and going step towards the, the sound bone, then you can feel uh, the sound bone and then really uh, the, the quality of the, of, of the wool and the touching element. 
And uh, it's also because the the headphone the, is has a limited the has a limited frequency. It's 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 uh, yeah it's clear, but it it it's uh, it has no uh, low end. So uh, this uh, the the bone conductor, including the touch sound and the low end, gives the a very full spectrum and an intense uh, yeah hearing perspective. So it is at, when you uh, touch the, the the bone itself, then the two hearing perspectives are really mixed and yeah create create an intense uh, experience. And of course, the people were experimenting. You can see it here and there. Uh, so she, in, in a way, she is, um, yeah, conducting herself, uh, yeah, a sense cross, because the the Rune sound bone has uh, has also, a, yeah, a kind of stereo. It's not a real stereo, but it's a, a two channel. But it has, and uh, so there's the the, yeah. The horizontal and the, and the vertical uh, element. So there are all kinds of, uh, and when you you yeah you make contact and you put it to your body, it's it's going through the, the sound is going through your whole body. So um, yeah, very fast. You can read <coughs> more information with, uh, about uh, the bone conductor and the and the history. It, it 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 needed a long time to really to to become to to become uh, yeah useful in uh, in uh, as a medical art. And the bone conducting headphones at, at this moment they are also using them for commercially for sports etc. Yeah, we 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 receive the sounds from outside and inside our body. The bones and organs in our body are constantly conducting subtle and lesser subtle vibrations in several frequency ra ranges. So we are literally part of our surrounding sound habitat. And conducting, or bone conducting, is always part of our multisensorial hearing perspective. Um, yeah, in the follow-up of the, of the bone conductor pro project, because I first started this for the festival uh, public, I decided uh, to explic explicitly present uh, the bone conductor for a blind, sight, disabled and deaf and hearing disabled people to gain more inclusive knowledge of the sound habitat. By sharing their uh, own perspectives and interviewing them and yeah, using their reactions and also interviewing them about how they are uh, moving through the environment, how they are navigate, and how they are use their, uh, yeah, their uh, new sense abilities because they have sense disabilities, but they also gain new uh, uh, abilities. And um, I'm I'm going to at the end of the, uh, the 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 research I'm going to to make new compositions of that with uh, combinations of reactions. To uh, to give the po the possibility for the public uh, to yeah to hear uh, other sound yeah, sound uh, multisensory pers perspectives of of people of blind people of hearing disabled people people yeah uh, I was also inspired by uh, Piet uh, Piet De Vos of nou ja, Piet De Vos <laughs> he's a Belgian uh, a Belgian scientist he's a writer and lit literary theorist. Uh, him, and he is blind himself. Uh, he recently was using binaural recordings as a tool for doing auto-ethnographic research to share sonic realities of blind and sighted. The shared listening practice when using binaural recordings, including the sounds of the cane, have the ability to evoke memory traces of multisensory experiences. Uh, this can create meaningful knowledge about the difference between persons with different sensibilities. In this art article, Piet uh, de Vos supports the creative use of technology to explore different individ individual experiences instead of using technology or methods that are enforcing normative ten tendencies. Um, 
Um, okay, and I want to let you hear something. This was my first uh, meeting with uh, Ton Hulskramer. Uh, Ton, Ton Hulskramer, uh, yeah, he's, he's uh, uh, 57, and I, I think, yeah, 57. And he is, uh, yeah, he got blind on his uh, uh, 20, when he was 20, and he had a, um, uh, a genetic uh, disease, and he got blind in, um, uh, in two weeks. And I, will, I, I also will present some reactions of Hannes Lauraven. He had the same, uh, yeah, rather unique, uh, seldom uh, genetic uh, disease, and he was getting blind in uh, two months. And he was, uh, yeah, he was a photographer before that, so. But then, uh, after he was getting blind, in, in that period, he immediately uh, changed uh, his way and become, uh, uh, yeah, also like a sound artist and working for people with a sound and, uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, now I will hear, let hear you the, my first meeting. Would you want to explain that for the first experiment? My first meeting with uh, with Tom. Oh yes, okay. Then <laughs> we go for it. The sound you made uh, was was very uh, very good. The, the beautiful thing I found was with the water. If you very good with the water, it was it was also real water. It was noise from real water, but it was very nice and uh, it gives peace and uh, give me rest. Uh, and then the birds were flying there, and uh, all these surroundings, the sounds, so were very nice and mixed together. Yeah. yeah. So it treated so it treated also associations with also reminiscences. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I feel it. Uh, this 
the bone I was lying on my on my legs and when I was sitting or in my stomach and in your stomach uh, you feel it very well also uh, the treating of the sound and it gives them uh, a very uh, nice uh, feeling when, when it was ready this whole experience I feel relieved and I feel very uh, light if, the, if the, the noise were totally went through my whole body from my head to my toes Outside the room, I started um, listening to uh, the bone conductor. This headphone my bone connected to my, to, to my bones. So I was surprised by uh, listening to that kind of uh, sound quality. And it was a little bit like a binaural experience. So then I entered the room. So there was the second uh, sound device. Uh, it, you call it the bone. So those two sounds which are sync experiences got mixed into each other so yeah it was an interesting experience of getting lost a little bit in a way yeah? because mm -hmm. then the room it's getting filled with that whole sound design uh, of, of that moment the third experience I love at most uh, because I was able much more to um, distinct different uh, layers in your uh, composition so because of that differentiation I was much more able as well to listen to the, the experience of my own reality in this room eh? oh, yes. uh, one moment uh, after, the, after that I also interviewed them about becoming yeah, about their way how they move in the sound habitat and which sounds they liked or not liked and which fu ideas of future, future soundscapes they have and also in Amsterdam so but you can read it in the paper uh, I, I'm not, I was not able yet to uh, to do presentations for uh, with the bone conductor for um, uh, hearing disabled <coughs> people but I, I did uh, I had presentations uh, for them uh, in uh, older projects and there are also links uh, to that projects in, uh, in, in the paper. So the conclusion is uh, on a global scale we can enrich our inclusive knowledge of the sound habitat by sharing our personal multisensorial hearing perspectives and become joint creative responsible performers, conductors and composers of the global composition. That would be uh, a nice thing <laughs> when that happens. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we can I now take five minutes to start a discussion or if you have questions to ask. Um, feel free. Um, just for clarification, you brought the uh, microphones, the uh, uh, they are called the microphone, yeah. the bone, and uh, bone conducting headphones are then uh, connected with microphones? Uh, no, no, there's not, there's, there's, it's, it's uh, all about the, the presentation of the wooden sound bone. The, the, is, there's, there are compositions, I, I compose them for them. And uh, you can hear them uh, mixed with the information it, uh, and from this on, from now on, it's the same composition. So it's it's uh, mixed and it's sync. Yes. So, we can, and, and that, that creates more in, intensive uh, experience. And and I'm I'm using the a binaural uh, mic, a microphone to uh, yeah to, uh, to to create the the compositions and also to interview the, the people and uh, and I will put the, uh, that in later compose that with reactions to create more yeah so that you. Yeah, because when I was uh, working with uh, uh, with Ton, I I immediately I immediately changed my uh, hearing perspective because I was working with a blind person. I felt uh, very responsible. I thought I I had the idea. There was the first meeting. I had the idea that uh, 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 I was responsible for his safety, and uh, and I had to fill in his in to fill in his visual. Uh, disability, but 
that was really not uh, not the issue. But it it he, he is he is very sportive uh, man, and he has the longest uh, stick. And uh, later, so it really after the after the interview, it refreshed my perspective of 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 blind people, and uh, because he had the long stick and he was walking. And I couldn't reach until he was walking again to the to the ferry. So I <laughs> and he was demonstrating how how fast he could walk with with the stick. <laughs> I was running after him. I got really refreshed, and I uh, yeah I was with uh, an organization for blind people, and they were saying, oh yes, but uh, they are very um, uh, normal people, and uh, they like the, to be quiet, and we. We, do, we are doing activities, but it's uh, very, um, yeah, uh, <coughs> it costs them a very a lot of energy when they have new inputs. So, and but uh, Ton is really the upper side of it, and he he, he likes it, and he says, okay, yeah, uh, when I fall, that's that's part of it. But he also um, created the sense of um, a new sense of feeling. Yes, uh, feeling the building. The, the strange thing, I was walking with him, and I was, I, I became aware of of, the, of also feeling the building myself. So that it was also re, uh, another aspect of yeah, walking with a, a blind, blind man. So. Uh, yes, but um, there is because yeah, we know conducting of uh, uh, the, you have the conductors, uh, the uh, like speakers. I'm using speakers, but that that is uh, about about the strong beats. You can feel strong beats, but uh, the sounds you can feel, they are very subtle, and the range is very is, is much more larger than you think. So it's uh, it it starts beyond 20. 20 kilohertz, and and I think maybe you can until four, uh, 400 hertz. So there's a lot of uh, frequency, and there are also when a voice is also uh, has a lot of frequency in in, the, in it. So that there's there's also the element of touching, and so the the bone uh, con uh, conductor in combination with the headphone. Because the headphones, they are not, uh, yeah, they are, they, they, there is not no low end, so they have a really clear uh, image for the, yeah, for, for the voice, and for high, uh, high resonances, and with low, uh, yeah, with low resonance, that's, that's, yeah, but you, you, you can, uh, that you can use that as a, as a, yeah, what a for the, it's as a. <laughs> It's 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 good to, uh, to you can be, you can use that to to put uh, information in, in other soundscapes for it, for example, and that's also in military context they use it for strategical uh, elements to to give people uh, yeah um, information with the with with the bone conducting headphone uh, while they are still con continuing uh, and hearing everything. No, that, that, that's a, that's an interesting question because I I got that question uh, more often. But you can see it as a, f a therapy to get to to become more aware of the the sonic environment, in uh, with all uh, with all its aspects, also the aspects of of conducting and vibration. And of course, people were also uh, experimenting, and also do it uh, it's, uh, with each other to put it on 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 the bones and. And uh, yeah, I think it uh, it uh, has also really, yeah, like music therapy. It has also very it's very intense. Uh, you embody are embodying the sound, and my uh, experience is also that uh, yeah, for uh, children and people in the autistic spectrum, they become very very quiet. So it's it's so intense. You are uh, going intensely. Uh, you are be able, become be able to intensely listening 
to the to the soundscape I, I composed, and you are creating and mixing and filtering yourself with your body and changing uh, the, the the sculpture. And uh, yeah, that that's that's uh, that's the thing. Okay, then I would say we will thank you for okay. this presentation. So thank you all so much for being here. And I, sorry that that one's not uh, fully working, but uh, I'm handing out this zine to you um, because I am a strong advocate of embodiment and I, I feel that uh, sometimes it, well, not sometimes, it's always better to m write your own notes and so I thought I would give you this little zine and you could make your own comments. Uh, whenever the topic comes up. Great. Have we got any PowerPoints in here? Uh, excuse my back there. That should be it. Yeah, that's that should be it. Do you go to that? Uh, I thought I did. If I don't, everything's going to be all right, as it always does. Hmm. How typical and... I think this is the PowerPoint file, but... Yeah, but it's not there. Yeah. Oh, that's so typical. Well, if we get the internet, I'm going to be okay. We have to do it all yours. Okay. Well, it's a good thing that I've got the zine ready, <laughs> huh? That didn't that work out? Whew. Um, just a quick comment on Ricardo's talk. Um, the book, Barry Blesser's book, Oral Architecture, Spaces Speak, are you listening, uh, came to mind immediately because on my way here, uh, I was um, engaging and listening very much to uh, the conversation and I walked smack in front of a pillar um, but I remember hearing the pillar before I saw it you know um, and I, I work as a singer and a singing teacher very much on um, notions of how I listen to people's voices so I'd like to tell you a little bit about that today how do we hear and listen to the voices around us every day? How much of each day do we spend paying attention to voices? And how many other voices are simultaneously emitting around us in the music in and information barrage of contemporary urban society? I'm referring to the oral soundscape here as encompassing the ecology of human voices that occupy public and private space in real life or electronically transmitted. But what is a voice exactly? There's the voice of a people or the voice of a movement. There is your inner voice, our unconscious voice. In terms of singers, we mean very different things when referring to the voice of Maria Callas or of Nina Simone the voice of Bob Dylan or Freddie Mercury. Then there's the matter of the spoken voice and of verbal versus nonverbal communication. We've been conditioned to think that it is language that is the primary tool of communication. But the voice is capable of so very much more. The voice occupies too many crucial roles in psychoanalysis to describe here but is most notably referred to as the object of desire or objet petit a by Lacan. The acoustic e qualities of voice, including timbre, intonation, accents, rhythm, and pitch, all influence how we speak and listen to each other. Even the rate at which we speak influences those around us and is simultaneously influenced by our own surroundings. The Russian-born linguist Richard Robin 
has noted that the rate of speech in 1987 was considerably slower during the unified Soviet Union than in 1991, conveniently um, the dissolution among television presenters, as if many points of view suddenly had in, entered the, um, the sphere and so people were talking faster because there was more to, to say. Barack Obama was accused by critics of conveniently adopting a black infection at opportune moments and elsewhere of speaking white. Hillary Clinton was also occasionally accused of adapting a southern drawl. And Margaret Thatcher was well known for having developed a lower fundamental speaking pitch in order to sound more authoritative. And I witnessed, I witnessed this during Hillary Clinton's election, her voice getting just slowly lower and lower and lower, probably, possibly due to vocal fatigue, but I would assume more toward adopting a voice of authority. How do we typically hear our own voice compared to the voice of others? Consider this. A voice can never sound the same to a listener as to its owner. The listener hears through air conduction, but the speaker or singer hears through air and also bone conduction, as the last paper so eloquently presented. The feeling of shock or discomfort that most of us get when we hear our voice on a recording is because the voice no longer resonates within our own body. That's nice. Um, oh, oh, fabulous. How did the, oh, that's the presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, so some important facts, I think, that men's typical frequency is there. <laughs> and women's is about 100 hertz above, and children just a little bit higher. The highest singing frequency the female chords can produce is about uh, 1K. However, the normal frequency for a scream is 3K. And uh, I get this constantly from people. So I, I teach singing and I help people with singing um, with vocal problems of all kinds and I'm constantly running across people who go oh no I can't sing high <laughs> I could never do that and then they laugh you know at this really high register <laughs> so men's fundamental frequency is generally less loud than females because it is lower and Conversation speech is generally around 50 dB. Jackhammer is 90 dB. And an opera singer can have an extremely high vo um, impact volume-wise with her voice. And as an aside, it's been pointed out, probably in Barry Blesser's book, that um, opera only began to be high, you know, in the thousand hertz reg register uh, after the um, invention of opera houses. Because when it was restricted to church singing, the reverb would generally take care of things. And uh, before a performance was in chambers, before it became uh, necessary to present to huge groups, uh, it was never that high. Ah. And now the distinction between speaking and singing voices I always find fascinating because speaking is generally less loud and uh, with less of a range. Uh, speaking is generally a lower frequency than uh, singing. When you raise your voice in song, that term, generally means that people start 
emitting at a higher frequency so they can be heard. Uh, in speaking, we use consonants for language. And as I'm speaking to you now, I'm really generally producing from my throat. Um, and it is the consonants that are giving you the syntax and the meaning. But if I were to sing, it would be, as Caruso put it, going from one vowel to the next, occasionally punctuated by consonants. In speaking, we can be far more precise, though. Uh, and in pitch-based languages, Asian languages, of course, we know that uh, pitch is very much uh, an important part of the language. Thank you. Yay. So pitch is, oh, OK. Hey, 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 stop it. Um, oh, boy, I can't make it go back. Thank you. OK, we're ready to go. So moderate vocal tract resonance. Uh, so when we're speaking, as I'm speaking to you now, I'm basically producing from here. But because I studied singing most of my life, uh, when I go to sing and when I go to help people sing, I encourage them to use their whole body as a resonance chamber. So if I'm speaking, if I, and when I hear people um, produce vocally, uh, generally I can tell if they're really nervous and there's some shallow breathing and they're speaking basically from up here and their voice is just a little bit softer uh, but if they are feeling confident they will take a breath from deeper and they will make more of the torso vibrate and suddenly their voice becomes a little bit fuller a little bit more powerful and so that's what I'm going to try to develop right now Ah, here we have the vocal tract, and I always use this to help to help people sing. I like to take it away from the. Uh, I like to de demystify what the voice is, and I often think of it uh, like a brass instrument. You've got the. Um, you've got the power supply that comes from the lungs. And then you have this oscillator, which is right here in the vocal folds. And then this whole thing, it becomes your resonance cavity. And so and you're going from here, from this, the vocal folds, which are basically like two blades of grass being blown. Trevor Wishart, uh, the gentleman who wrote on Sonic Art, uh, said that if we had no head, we would sound, our voice would sound like a duck call because it would be <laughs> But it is this whole space in here uh, that you can use, which is almost like the bell of a saxophone, changing the shape of the horn minutely to change the quality uh, uh, of the sound. So, so this is basically how it works. And then, if I can, show you, take you to the internet, to the, might not work, and if it doesn't, that's okay. Yeah, no server. Okay, singing in the MRI. <laughs> I'll just sing the version. So, um, I welcome you, The this is, uh, in the book, and I welcome you to go to this link um, to see an MRI of how the voice, uh, uh, how the vocal tract changes shape as a singer uh, makes sound. And um, so in your convenient little zine there, in the picture of the vocal tract, you have 
uh, with an MRI, you can see how the, uh, the vellum and all around the vocal tract changes shape. From an MRI, you can only see a two-dimensional perspective. But uh, it is true that the entire shape of the aperture changes constantly. And it's like um, a 3D malleable saxophone of tissue and bone that infinitely changes shape. Let's go here as well on your um, zines is another, oh wow, I've gone completely off book again, as I <laughs> will normally do. And that's because I am fascinated with this topic, and um, I just love to talk about it. But did you realize that the way we make vowels, well, okay, first of all, to back up, when, you he when you're hearing my voice, you're hearing me speak, you're hearing my fundamental at around 300 hertz. But the fact is, your ear, your brain is hearing this one thing, but sonically what's really going on is you're hearing the 300 hertz, the 600, the 900, and you're hearing all of these sounds come together placed into one sound. And so the only difference in an ah and an oo is where uh, there are three or four basic um, overtones, partials in the sound, in the vocal sound called formants. And that is what uh, changes to make a vowel. So I encourage you to try, and so this is inside the mouth, what you would have seen in the MRI, very uh, dramatically, but here it is. And so I encourage you, actually, to just take, um, notice an E, make an E sound yourselves right now. E. And you notice that your tongue and the roof of your mouth are close together, right? And it's a really small, tight space. And E, perhaps you're um, showing a little bit of teeth on an E. And so when you change that to e ah, notice how your mouth opens slightly and changes. e ah, and now go e ah, notice how your mouth changes there. And then some very basic sonic principles. When you're making the e, you sh a little bit of teeth are involved, and that's hard, that's resonant. And then when you go to, and so the E sound is relatively bright, you might say, E. And then when you go to an oo, oo, notice that your lips are covering, and it's almost, it's matting the sound, making it a little bit darker. And this, this tissue, literally, your upper lip, is changing that sound. Um, and so each time, when a, um, I also t talk about a, uh, a guitar or a resonance chamber. And so you can see here the resonance chamber is fairly big. Ooh. But, uh, and then in the ah, or yeah, in the ah, you have a big chamber here as well. And then in the E, you have this very small chamber up here, but still to resonate the lower part of the larynx and pharynx opens up a little bit. So there's always got to be a resonance chamber inside for you to make sound. Ah, the human vocal tract differs from that of other animals in that the resting position of the larynx is much lower in humans. This is what gives us such tremendous flexibility of expression. In general, voices, human voices, aren't intended for traveling long distances. Um, what I just said, the trend of classical singing has been fashionable uh, to be so high since the introduction of the concert hall. 
In small animals, such as birds, however, their vocalizations are critical to their survival. And so they have a capacity to make sounds that for their size are up to 100 times more powerful than humans. This is achieved by emitting as well at a very high frequency, but also by using their bodies to reflect and radiate the sound within their vocal tract. The, um, on voice, gender, and identity, the pitch of the human voice is deeply coded by gender. The poet Anne Carson, in her essay, Gender of Sound, explains that Aristotle wrote that the high-pitched voice of the female is one evidence of her evil disposition. For creatures who are brave or just, like lions, bulls, roosters, and the human male, have large, deep voices. Contemporary cultural trends employ acoustical insights by uh, using spectrograms to help transgender folk feminize their voice. I would, uh, I would argue that um, it's not necessary uh, to have a voice feminized. Holy. Uh, <laughs> But, um, and, and so I have online as well, um, I have online as well um, a reference to um, a female voice spectrogram. Um, this, is, um, this is me singing E-A-R-O-U. And so here you see the basic formants for E and then A. E-A-R-O-U e in the spectrogram. And I'm singing a, a low A. And here I am singing the same thing an octave higher. OK, I'm going to just flow through here as fast as possible. Hmm. Um, the notion of Vocal materiality is essential at this point in expressing the connection of voice with physical presence. We're living in the era, era of the globally mediatized voice where the human voice is most often heard electronically in an algorithmically compressed semblance of itself than from its actual body. The condition of schizophonia describes this well, that of sound being separated from its source. I propose that direct human-to-human -human communication is the obvious antidote to the disembodied orality that defines contemporary society. Another apt description of this would be the acousmatic voice. Uh, this comes, I'm sure you're all aware, from Pierre Schaeffer, but also from Pythagoras from the sixth century. One of my oldest compositions comes to mind with regard to these questions of how the voice is perceived and delivered. Um, what is being transmitted by the voice through technology and how do we navigate these sonically artificial spaces while creating new imaginary spaces. Uh, I'm not going to play that now because I don't think we have enough time for this. Oh, yeah? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, we should do some singing. I, I would uh, like to just mention uh, about the acousmatic voice advanced by uh, Michel Chion. When one listens to a voice on the radio or a voiceover in film, one has no choice but to listen. Chion talks about vococentric pursuit of the ear that feels it is being addressed by the authoritative tone of the human voice. Some helpful examples of the acousmatic voice in history are God in the Old Testament, the Wizard of Oz, and Norman Bates' mother in Psycho. In Psycho. The philosopher Mladen Dolar, a Slovenian um, philosopher uh, who put out a book called A Voice and Nothing More, 
draws a paradoxical conclusion that the voice is always, by definition, acousmatic. The source of the voice can never be seen since it stems from an undisclosed and structurally concealed interior and cannot possibly match what we can see. The voice comes from inside the body, the belly, the stomach, from something incompatible with and irreducible to the activity of the mouth. In vocalizing, we fill the exterior world with the physical energy that is generated by our own breath and transformed into sound. This sound, regardless of meaning, is physical proof of our existence and a means of occupying spaces of all kinds. Architecture is an important aspect in this process, and the notion of the voice in public space is of particular interest to me. Many of the large-scale uh, compositions have been about there. This is the spectrogram uh, program that uh, has been used by transgender people to train their voice to have feminine attributes. I strongly encourage you to have a listen to it. It's, it's funny how uh, the voice is defined. I like this picture because I think it uh, symbolizes my aesthetic to some extent. Um, and then an ongoing project for over a decade that I've had uh, has been called HUM. And yeah, uh, it's OK. I can describe it to you. Um, so what I've done is I've uh, often given workshops to people on how their voice how the voice works, I uh, record them just vocally, and then I make a soundtrack uh, based on their sounds. I've been doing pi low watt radio, pirate radio for decades now, and so generally I'll broadcast uh, over radio the sound of people's humming and they carry a portable radio with them and we go off to explore s spaces a bit like echolocation uh, and we would do it on the subway and lots of different places going and just infusing the space with this vocal sound this human sound and uh, I've had some wonderful experiences such as in Lima, Peru which is a very noisy city Immediately when they uh, see uh, some pieces of technology, the police love to come up. They usually come up to a man, and they assume the man is in charge, and I'm, and I'm just walking right by. Uh, but this time... <laughs> and the older I get, the more invisible I get, so it's, it's all good. It works out. Um, but they've accused uh, you know, us of um, disturbing the peace when in fact, when this human sound is going on, people relate and the listening just starts to infuse in the space. So uh, I had another wonderful uh, experience with a choir of architects in Slovenia and they just went through the space just just exploring um, that was a beautiful one uh, one a really a big one was on Saint Laurent Street the main street in Montreal during a, a sidewalk sale and I managed to get community radio to broadcast and uh, I had a war with them uh, to be able to broadcast the hum through the street merchants radio uh, source and they by no means wanted this to happen because it would make people too calm and not buy enough stuff but I finally won and about 200 250 of us walked all along this long street about a mile and it did feel like a tsunami really of human sound in particular it's non-verbal it's not language, and it's just relating from body to body, which I find so fascinating. Um, and now? Now we have like 15 minutes left, and five to 15 minutes can be used to solve the session. Okay. All right. Mm, 
I um, would just say a few words about myself. I've uh, been creating these pieces for choirs, been working with choirs of all kinds uh, for many years, and I have been writing uh, compositions for large spaces where uh, different things can happen in different acoustic spaces. And so I love engaging uh, big groups of people, non-musicians sometimes, and we use a, a score that has an accompanying map. Uh, and uh, I, I made one recently in a, a big garden, in, uh, about 50 acres of garden, and uh, we were singing the names of these flowers in Latin, French, and English through, through a garden. Lately, I uh, am working with low-watt radio transmitters in my home of the Gas Bay, which is on the east coast of Quebec. Uh, and Gas Bay has these uh, barachois, these salt marshes, which appear and then disappear daily. They're very ephemeral. They, and uh, with radio transmitters, we will go out to a remote spot where no one else can be uh, if the tide, uh, given a certain moment in the tide, but uh, you can drive all around these spaces. You know, you, you, you have to drive like 30 kilometers by land, which you could cross maybe in five kilometers if you were to go by water. And so people are surrounding these large, large bodies in cars. And so I transmit my own voice to them on radio. Uh, and they can be driving for 30 or 40 kilometers and hear me and vaguely see me. But I'm in this space by myself, which is often completely surrounded by water. And it's, it's a very magical experience. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, probably leave that, leave it there in the hope that you will uh, participate with me on the last page of the zine. Um, I would point out that I was, I was present at the Tuning of the World conference 25 years ago. And Hildegard was there, Claude Schreier was there, Pauline Oliveros was there and made a huge impact on me then and has for all my life. And uh, I would like to try out the piece, Environmental Dialogue, with you in a few moments after questions or comments. So thank you so much for your listening. I went so fast. I would like to ask a question. I read that you give uh, lectures about vocal empowerment. Yes. And I was asking myself, how can I empower my voice? <laughs> uh, that uh, goes back so far, and it's such a timely question because. Um, I used to give them with uh, a friend who taught self-defense, and we gave vocal empowerment. We used to call it WENCH, Women's Empowerment Now Creating Havoc, or we would change the thing, <laughs> the thing around. Um, and generally, it, it, it has been uh, the, the, a question among women. I've also gotten, I've had a, Psychologists come to me, uh, you know, uh, asking, I need more gravitas in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. And I would, I would say, like, the simple, fastest answer is just to take a really, to be able to take a big breath and to breathe. If you, if you can connect through breath, I, I think that uh, that is most likely to help to help your voice. What would you like to do with your voice? Well, actually, I'm from a background of uh, 
radio and journalistic work, and I was wondering, people tend to say, wow, he has the perfect radio voice. It's so powerful, and it's so amazing, and That's he's probably nice. born with it. And I was wondering, are the people born with that kind of voice, or yeah, yeah. why is that that they well, sound so full? Right. Well, some people have uh, a natural singer's voice. Um, and some people just resonate more easily from different areas of their body. But I think everyone has the same capacity. Apparently, the larynx of a human is very like the larynx of a dog. And the physiology is generally the same. Sometimes we have a predisposition, you know, to a slightly more nasal sound, which gives it a little bit more carry, a little bit more brilliance. But uh, I think we all have the capacity. And before recording technology, how people described a sound to each other, they would imitate it with their voices. That's all we had before recording technology. And so when we think we can't it, we can't sing, but suddenly we imitate an opera singer. That's it, you know. If you did it for a second, you can develop the technique to do it for a longer term. So I don't think you need any work on your voice. You have a great voice. Uh, but I would say that uh, generally we tend to not inflect, uh, have a, a, a very big range of inflection. Uh, and we're, we've been uh, we've been told by society that authority is deeper. I remember when Siri came in, there was so much um, controversy whether Siri should be a woman or a man, and uh, a lot of people felt like it should be a male voice to be authoritative, and the fact that it was a female voice was more soothing. And. Um, I think that in general, uh, oh, and, and teachers who get tired from speaking, it's usually because they're just using this really narrow range of frequencies. And you'll notice probably my voice is quite sing-song, and, and it's a way of freeing your voice up to just allow some of the higher things that come in. Uh, and it is a way to be far more expressive, just by allowing your voice to be a little bit uh, wider in range. Thank you. So, any more questions? Just a short clarification. I was fascinated by the plyo of architects. Um, just imagining all these architects. One thing I didn't quite get clear is, um, are the architects or anyone, any of the groups, are they doing the humming live? Yes, they and are. How does that relate to the transmitter? Good question. And, and some would say that transmitters are not necessary, but I do feel like in the case of radio, uh, low watt FM radio, it uh, functions by line of sight. It is very close to human scale of transmission as well. And so I use the radio as just basically a uniter for everyone and something for them to work off. And I, I feel like it's just an extension of their own body because it is this one thing uh, that they carry with them. As, so the, sorry, but the transmitter then has already a sound on it. Which is their own voices. OK, but they're also saying. Yes, oh, okay. and so they're working with the environment and a recording of themselves. So these two things, and just I, I feel like it closes the circuit a little bit more and allows them to, it's also a metaphor for engaging with technology in a self-controlling, self-empowering uh, um, uh, way. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you have tried with only the voice without the voice, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm thinking of the old times that people uh, didn't have these yes. and uh, yes. used to, their voice used to, in, in the 
open space to yes. carry further. Yes. And now we tend to be more closed. And I was wondering if that would be an experience that would encourage this sending the voice further away. Yes, so much so. I use humming because it has the mouth closed and uh, pe people don't know whether you're making sound or not and it's just that much easier for people to engage with. But with a group of willing people, I would love to be do making open sounds and really exploring uh, because I think we all use echolocation normally in life. Mm. the next keynote speaker, so if there is a workshop like a small um, uh -huh. example or something yeah. that you can provide, then we can join with that and then close this session. All right. Thank you so much. All right. For So, so the last page, uh, um, environmental dialogue. Each person finds a place to be, either near to or distant from the others. Either indoors or outdoors, I think we'll just do that here. Begin by the meditation. So you're all familiar with Pauline Oliveros, right? I don't need to. Um, in 71, she produced this score called Sonic Meditations. And this is one, the one that I, I have so much uh, connection with. As you become aware of sounds from the environment, gradually begin to reinforce the pitch of the sound source. Reinforce either vocally, mentally, or with an instrument. If you lose touch with the source, wait for another one. And so reinforce means to strengthen or sustain. If the pitch of the sound source is out of your range, then reinforce it uh, mentally. So basically, what I'm asking us, not you, but us, to do is to take a few moments to listen to the sounds around us. And as soon as you get, as soon as you hear a sound, just to emit a drone. But we can do that. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we walk just outside for a moment. So can I ask you all to stand up? Just have a stand up for a second. And before we go, let me just ask you to just roll those shoulders out a little bit. And here's a very, a very quick thing you can do. The yawns are great. The yawn is your body saying, I'm going to need more oxygen for this by the way, and so the more you yawn, the better. You're also activating the back here of the soft palate. Which, there's a long story to that, but I'm going to ask you to just do this one thing with me. Go. Good. Not too many stiff upper lips, huh? So rev it a little bit. How high can you go? the most, the fastest vocal exercise you can do. What you're doing is you're loosening up all of this, which becomes so stiff because of what we have to, uh, this is how we face society, right? And so we keep so much tension around here. And this will make you want to yawn because your body will say, oh, need more oxygen. And you can press all along the jaw right here. This is all tongue musculature. And if we were, if we had an hour, I would tell you at length, when you feel what you feel going on in here is you pressing <coughs> the tension out of your body. You're likely to have a lot of, if you cough, you're likely to feel even slight nausea, at, which tells you how connected the tongue tissue is to the vital organs. So these are like fast things that you can do for your voice to wake your voice up and reduce some tension. But now, uh, let's say that we just walk out to a central space together. And uh, when I say go, we'll begin 
uh, just listening at, to any sound we hear and reinforcing it. Shall we go? Just a little bit outside. So with eyes closed or open, facing us or facing the wall. Uh, just treat yourself to the next 10 minutes. And whatever sound, anytime you hear a sound, uh, another uh, exercise in sonic meditations, which I find really essential in Pauline Oliveros' work, is the all or nothing. Uh, and that allows you to react or enables you to react quickly. If a sound goes by and you didn't, and you didn't respond quickly enough, wait. Just wait for another sound. But from here on in, for the next 10 minutes, every time you hear a sound that interests you, I'd like you to just repeat that sound with any drone. It can be an ah, an ooh, a moo. Mm. It doesn't matter. Just reinforce that sound with some vocal sound, starting now.